Hello and welcome to the next in the series of free classes for Leaving Cert English students and others. Today we're going to be dealing with the composing section of Leaving Cert Honours Paper 1. So the first thing to say is that, that and it's, this is an obvious thing, but people often ignore it, you have to prepare. You know, I know, because uh, I've taught many kids over many years, that it's something that people almost leave on the back foot. Yes, you spend time writing essays, but how many of you really spend as much time preparing for your composition as you spend, for example, on your prescribed text, something like Hamlet, or your comparative text, or your prescribed poetry? The reality is you don't. That, that's just the truth. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that there's ways to do that in as, as structured a way and as effective as a way as you would in preparing for any section of the exam. So the first thing as ever is to understand clearly what it is they're looking for. And we're lucky in this respect in that we do know what the marking scheme is for Leaving Cert examiners. And it looks like this. It looks like some very poorly drawn um, lotto numbers. But the reality is there's, there's really clear definitions around each of these. There's four things in total that the examiner will grade your essay on and with one small proviso at the bottom. They're going to look at the clarity of purpose, coherence of delivery. I'll go into each of these, efficiency of language and accuracy of mechanics. But they'll also point out that they will never give you a higher mark for the use of language, for example, than for the actual content of the essay itself, which is the first tip of these things here, the P. So let's talk about that. What do we mean by clarity of purpose? Well, the phrase marshalling your evidence is often used, but frankly, I hate that. I hate that. It sounds as if you're sending words into war. The, the key phrase here is just clarity. Is what you're saying or arguing or describing or recounting clear? Do you have a clear idea, argument or theory? Is there a clearly defined narrative if what you're doing is writing a short story? And relevance obviously also caught, uh, really counts here. Is what you're writing directly connected to the subject of the question? And then we come to coherence of delivery. And again, you know, a truism that's often thrown out is that this means the beginning, middle and end, having a clear beginning, middle and end. Well, the reality is two of the greatest books ever written by Irish authors, Tristram Shandy's, uh, Lauren Stern's Tristram Shandy and Flann O'Brien's At Swim Two Birds would abjectly fail that standard. So what does coherence really mean here? Well, think of it from the examiner's position. Do I know what the hell he or she is on about? Do they digress so much that I'm getting lost or are they using words that they don't really understand so it becomes confusing? It simply means being coherent in that very, very basic level. You know, do I understand what you are writing or not as an examiner? And then coherence of delivery. Well, delivery here means structure. If you set out to make a claim at the start of your essay, do you succeed in making that claim by the end, in backing up the points that you make with evidence, in, in following the narrative arc of a short story to a satisfying conclusion, or bringing a scene that you're describing to life? And then we come to efficiency of language. And, and efficiency is an interesting word, because what should language do to be efficient? Effectively, it must communicate. That's the purpose of language. So you're looking here to see whether you can communicate an idea, a feeling, an emotional response or a well-told story in an effective and efficient way. It doesn't mean that we all have to write like Ernest Hemingway in short, sparse sentences, but that you should use language for a purpose rather than just for effect. We should always remember who the examiner is. You're dealing with somebody who loves English. And as, as a lover of English, there are things that, that will impress them, things that they will like to see. Here are some of the things we talked about in, in the class on the unseen poem. Things that you should have in your mental uh, kit bag as you think through the essay and you look back at what you've written. You know, what sort of dictionary are you using? Is it Latinate? Are there, you know, long words and short words at a very basic level? But are you having an opportunity to display the breadth of your uh, of your vocabulary? Are you using things like apostrophe, which is a direct address to the reader or rhetorical questions or pathos when you're appealing to their symphony or sympathies? Are you using some forms of figurative language or imagery? Are you using sound effects to convey the tone as you describe things in the course of the, of, of the essay, whether that's a discursive essay or a descriptive or a short story? The other thing you should remember is that examiners, people like me, are the last card carrying co cohort of grammar Nazis on the planet. We don't want to judge you on your use of grammar. We may even have been told that we shouldn't judge you on your use of grammar. But the reality is we can't help it. Just like if my daughter showed up with a new boyfriend who was wearing a man new shirt, I'd struggle. Yes, so he spends his spare time volunteering at an animal sanctuary and he's taken a pledge never to drink until he's 21, along with a vow of celibacy. And he's turned up with a bottle of my favourite whiskey, which I get to keep to myself because he's teetotal. But still, I'm judging him. 
I just can't help it. And the reality is that an examiner, somebody like me, will be doing much the same. It's not that they're going to take lots of marks off you for your bad spelling or forgetting to capitalize words. It's that you're going to distract them from what you're writing by the way you're writing. Now, when you make simple grammatical errors and repeat these in the course of the essay, you lose their sympathies. And more importantly, you lose their attention. You draw their attention away from what you're writing about. So let's quickly talk about some of the things that drive grammar Nazis like me and totally insane. Well, the first one that we see is the, the, the use of an apostrophe anywhere where the letter S can be found. You know, scattering them broadly anytime you see a plural drives people like me crazy. Here's, here's one from a huge billion dollar corporation, Starbucks, who, who thought it was a wise idea to launch a nationwide campaign saying great taste deserves it is own reward. Because, of course, IT apostrophe S always means it is. Or this one, you know, Hayes Travel, you are holiday is in safe hands. Again, it's impossible for people like your Leaving Cert English examiners to walk down a street without reaching for an imaginary pen to cross off things like this every time they see them. Or the, the apostrophe that's missing entirely, you know, friendly Ben says, let's read again. Obviously, let's should be let us, uh, therefore L-E-T apostrophe S. But this is my favourite. You know, a company that doesn't know how to use the apostrophe called, well, there you are. Um, and of course, you know, there's only two occasions where you ever use an apostrophe. Either it's there to indicate a missing letter or letters, you know, the O in do not, when, when you abbreviate it to don't, or it's there to show ownership. John's iPhone, the girl's bag. If there's more than one girl, because there's more than one bags, so obviously the apostrophe goes after the S because it's the girls who are the owner. That's it. It's never used in a simple plural. You know this, but just be careful when you read back over your essay at the time you have that you pick up on things like this because things like this are irritants and you don't want to irritate your examiner. So while we're on the subject of things like this, you also realize that there are capital offenses and then there are things that are even worse. If you do this in front of an examiner, you remember put the poster V in, but you clearly don't know where to put it, then that's uh, something that's worthy of torture and then death. And while we're at it and talking about bugbears, well, if you want to understand a, um, an examiner, um, Ask them about this. You know, if you say to an examiner that you knew somebody who'd recently bought a pair of Nike, he will obviously assume that their use of the apostrophe is a complete catastrophe. Because of course, all words in English which come from the Greek and end in an E have the E pronounced. Nike, apostrophe, catastrophe. You know, and in fact, you know, one of the most famous characters in Greek mythology is the winged uh, goddess of victory, who, guess what, is called Nike. But that's a digression. Let's go back to the last of the sections that we're, we're of the marking scheme. And this is what's called the accuracy of mechanics. Now, it's only 10 marks, but that doesn't mean it's something that you should ignore. All mechanics in the sense really means is construction. So that means sentence construction, punctuation, simple stuff of that nature. It's a really quick way to pick up marks because all you need to do is remember to do things like indent the first line of your paragraphs. Just be careful that you structure in an appropriate way and those marks are yours for the taking straight away. So what is the thing we can take out of all of this? Well, essentially it's this, that what you write, that first section, the clarity of purpose, your argument, your story is worth 30 marks. Whereas how you write, the language you use, how effectively you structure your essay is worth 70. So when you go into the exam, just keep that in your mind. What you write, it doesn't matter how great a short story you come up with on the day, it's not going to be the thing that determines your final grade. It's your attention to the construction. It's your attention to language. It's your careful preparation to make sure that they are seeing the very best English that you can write. That's what's going to decide how well you do or how badly you do in the exam. So. Let's take that into practicalities. Well, the first thing you need to do in preparing for the Leaving Cert uh, Paper 1 composition section is to decide what sort of writer you are. And obviously, you're lucky in the sense that you have a number of choices. There are essay choices each year which allow you to write any of these. You can write a personal essay, which is, in, in general, generally speaking, is the most common choice. You can write a descriptive essay, a discursive essay, speech or article, or you can write a short story. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that they're all marked in exactly the same way. There isn't a separate uh, marking scheme and there isn't a separate set of things they're looking out for based on which type of story or essay you write. You will not get more marks for originality by writing an original short story than you will for writing a good personal essay. 
You won't get more marks for relevance in the same way. What they'll be looking at predominantly is how well you have shaped and developed the essay you've written, and most of all, the quality and control of the language you've used. So again, the key thing to take away here is you've got to prepare. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go through each of those essay types and talk about how you can prepare in an effective way to face each of them. And we'll start with the personal essay. Well, the big challenge most people have in the leaving sort of the personal essay is that they are boring. Now, that's not saying that you as individuals are boring, but the reality is most of your lives aren't particularly noteworthy. Now, if you're looking at this video while you're um, locked down due to the coronavirus outbreak, then it's even more boring than it would normally be. And it's not just about whether your life is subjectively boring or not. You again remember who your examiner is. Right. So what you've got to do if you're going to do well in this area might seem slightly counterintuitive. A personal essay, by the sound of it, should be nonfiction. What I'm suggesting, however, is that it should be exactly the opposite. If you want to write a personal essay which is interesting, which is something that's going to engage the examiner's attention and you know draw them into the narrative that you provide, then you've got to create a different you. You've got to invent a past that you can then leverage in the exam so that what you are saying and what you are writing about is interesting to the reader. Now, the good news is they don't know who you are. That's the whole thing about the anonymity of a Leaving Cert exam candidate. For all they know, you are, in fact, somebody who has been in some calamitous um, world event recently or a personal event. And you may indeed be somebody who has suffered through a, a horrendous illness or nursed someone within a family through the same. You may actually have walked over the, the, the Namibian desert uh, solo uh, as part of a challenge to raise money for charity. Uh, you may have traveled to exotic places. Please, if you do uh, do that, remember, don't just go to exotic places, do exotic things when you get there. Um, and of course, you could actually be an undiscovered author you know, trading here under the anonymity of the Leaving Cert, who's actually published and sold millions and millions of books. You can choose who to be. And my advice is that you should do that. You know, decide who you want to be in preparation for the exam. And I'll give you some examples of things you can do to ensure that what you write actually hits those buzzers of originality and freshness and actually draw the, the reader, the examiner in. So the, the guidance that's given here is that things should be relevant but original. Well, if you look at the type of essays that you've had in the past, these are the essay topics that were given over the past four or five years. You know, write a personal essay in which you reflect on what feeds your imagination. They're very broad. What you'll see all the way through is that this term reflecting is used throughout. So what do they mean by reflection? Essentially, it means you're looking back. You're writing a form of memoir. You're talking about events, but more importantly, you're talking about the effect of those events uh, upon your thinking or your way of viewing the world. So when you do that, bear that originality thing in mind. You want to think of things that the person beside you will not be saying, you know, things that feed your imagination. That could be anything, you know, things that have helped to shape and define you. Remember that it shouldn't be what the person beside you has uh, is about to write or has written before. Try and make sure that whatever your response is, it's something new, at least if not unique, at least original in that is different from the person beside you. So how can you prepare that? How do you make sure that you are prepared for a personal essay and can do work in advance that will score when you get in there? Well, the first thing I would suggest is pick a scenario or a persona that you can prepare in advance. Take this one as an example. You know, there's a huge amount of, of um, news at the moment about the challenge of homelessness in Ireland. There's a significant amount of people who are stuck in what's called temporary housing. They have been made homeless and are being shifted from um, guest house to guest house, from low rent hotel to low rent hotel. They don't have a chance to lay down roots. They're cut off from family and friends. They're crammed together. Imagine if you had prepared an essay around that scenario. You could apply that to any of these essay titles. You know, reflecting on what feeds your imagination when you're stuck in a very confined space. You know, thinking of the things that ha have helped to shape and define you or uh, the pleasures particular to youth and talking about how you're de deprived of them. A good scenario, a good persona like this, prepared well, will allow you to write in on any topic you will find in the exam. Just to, to repeat that, if you prepare a couple of good ones, you will find an essay topic that will allow you to write that story, that personal narrative. You know, here's another example of one you could do, you know, losing my sight at 16. You know, again, it's something that will allow you to 
uh, take that persona and apply it against any of the topics, any of the of the essay titles that have been there in the exams over the last five years. You know, reflecting on moments of insight and revelation. When you think of that from the perspective of someone who has lost their sight in, in their teenage years. Reflecting on personal space and quietness in the modern world. Again, almost ideal, tailor-made for it. And why am I suggesting that you actually prepare personas like this in advance for a personal essay? Uh, well, it's for these reasons. It, it lets you prepare. It lets you research in advance and not only to find out more about the subject so that you can be knowledgeable in, in, when you write about it, but it also gives you a vocabulary, a vocabulary that accompanies whatever that persona is, whatever that situation is, and allows you again to display your very best language. It lets you practice and hone descriptions you know, unique to that persona as well, to rehearse incidents or events until you can recount them in a way that is very, very effective. And the other thing is, because there's such a focus upon reflection or conclusion, that you're not having to do it on the spot in the exam. You've had a chance to consider what those reflections might be, and not only consider them themselves, so they, they sound thoughtful, they sound interesting, but you've also had the chance to practice how best to express them. So let's get on to the second type of essay, the descriptive essay. Well, what typically what we have here is an opportunity to create a scene, to evoke a scene or a sensation or um, a, an incident or event within a life. Um, but the challenge here is it often allows you to fall into what's called purple prose. There is a reason why editors of novels get out their red pen and draw big lines through descriptive passages, because in general, people take five images to say what one good image can say. And, and people writing descriptive essays sometimes fall into this trap. Now, the, the word here you see all the way through is capture. You know, you need to try and capture or evoke the scene that you're describing. And that's not easy to do. It's certainly not easy to sustain over around a thousand words without it becoming repetitious or frankly just boring. And the other thing to be, be aware of is that people also fall into a very, very simple, uh, simple trap in this instance. They see describe as meaning visualize and they are not synonymous. You know, visualizing is simply describing how things look. And people spend the majority of their time in descriptive essays doing exactly that. They, they describe appearance, they describe color, they, they describe everything that comes from the sense of sight. And they often neglect the other senses. You know, a writer like James Joyce uh, can successfully evoke a hot summer's day, not by describing um, the tulips in St. Stephen's Green Park, but the feeling of warm stone under the hand of a small boy when he sits down at a bench. Things of that nature, you know, every feature of language can be evocative. Don't restrict yourself to the visual. Think about the use of assonance and alliteration as well to convey tone, to help something become more truly evoked, more truly captured, as they say. And the other thing, obviously, to remember is that it's, it, this is really about quality, not quantity. So prepare your best images. A descriptive passage is going to need good similes and good metaphors. Don't wait to be inspired on the day. Come armed have them at your disposal. The other thing I would say is that this is the type of essay you should absolutely avoid unless you are really, really good at this and these things come really naturally to you. Now, you know, I, I think of somebody like uh, Blackadder, if you're familiar with the comedy series, and um, it, it's really, really funny and Blackadder himself loves to employ similes. But it's interesting when I look back over the four series, there's not actually that many of them. It's just that they're all memorable. You know, the girl is wetter than a haddock's bathing costume. Uh, my, my favourite of these is says, there hasn't been a war run this badly since Olaf the Hairy, king of all the Vikings, ordered 80,000 battle helmets with the horns on the inside. These things are used really effectively, but they've been honed. They've been written and rewritten to make sure that they are really effective. And if you're going to write a good descriptive essay, you need to prepare in the same way. Make sure you walk into the exam armed with the best imagery, the best descriptions that you can have. Even if you don't know what the subject is going to be, you can always turn a simile to, to make sure it can fit into a particular scenario. So then we get on to the discursive essay. Well, discursive essays are of various kinds. There's sometimes they have uh, strict conventions, like you're being asked to use something like a speech uh, in a debate or write an article for a journal or um, in, in, to, to, in a persuasive essay, as it's called in one of these instances. In every case, you're being asked to take a side and to make an argument. And that means that you're asked to adopt a point of view. Now, the key obviously here is uh, to pick the point of view that allows you to argue it best. You know, when you're asked, for example, in one of those essays, you know, to talk about the items you think symbolize the values held by people of your age in Ireland in 2019, 
again, don't write what the person beside you is writing. Maybe you think the things that best symbolize the values of people of your age in Ireland in 2019 are fake tan, molly and dad's credit card. Think of something different. Be original, be fresh as much as you can. Doesn't mean you have to be flippant. It certainly doesn't mean you can be irrelevant, but try to make sure that you're doing something that is different from those around you. And then lastly, obviously, observe the conventions. If you don't know how to frame a speech, a debate speech, don't do this because you'll lose marks instantly for not knowing what those conventions are. And we go on to the next one, the short story. Now, the short story is in many ways the most difficult. It's the most difficult to do on the day, largely because you have to face the unexpected. You can still prepare, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a, about that in a second. But as you can see from the last few years here, they are very, very different. They jump from genre, from situation. You know, in the first case, for example, you're asked to, to write a spy story specifically, so it has to fit into that genre, and you're given things that must be included as elements, a librarian, a photograph, and a chair. In, in other cases, you're being told, for example, that a tattoo must play an important part in the narrative. You know, in, in each case, though, what you'll see is there's a focus here upon narrative, upon plot, you know, or else upon character development. So how do you actually take on a challenge of this kind? Well, the challenge is quite extreme and the challenge really comes down to this. If you're writing a short story, you necessarily focus more upon what you're writing than how you're writing, and that's a challenge. If you have to come up with an original story on the spot, because in many cases that's what you will have to do, what you will be concentrating on is taking that story from your brain and putting it down on page uh, on the page as quickly as you can before it evaporates and disappears. The likelihood is you're going to make more mistakes you're going to have more misspellings, more mispunctuation. Uh, you're going to struggle to find the word and have to move on. And all the way through that first section of the exam, all your time is spent on the what and not the how. The structure is also going to be in trouble here as well, or at least have a challenge in that you'll be rushing to complete something. And sometimes sometimes stories tail off. Sometimes they get rushed towards a conclusion. All of these are major challenges to do with time, but there are ways to address this. And the other, obviously, the challenge here is that nobody is good at writing in every genre. And, and the challenge here is that you may be asked to write in a genre, a genre that you're not really familiar with. So how should you approach this? Well, first of all, is don't do this. Don't write a short story in your Leaving Cert exam unless you are good at it. And effectively, that means unless you're a writer. Unless you see yourself as somebody who would write outside of doing Leaving Cert English, you should probably avoid this because there are people who are much more skilled at this than you are. And, and how do you define a writer? Well, you know, Hemingway probably described it best when he said writers write. If you're somebody who writes outside of your Leaving Cert study, someone who feels compelled to create and write down stories of whatever kind, then fine, this might be the thing for you. But if you're somebody who would never think of writing a short story unless your teacher told you to do so, you should avoid this form. You know, it's not something you should do. If you fit into that first category, then what I'd also say is read everything. You know, don't restrict yourself to certain types of novels. Read across every genre because you've no idea what's going to show up in the exam. You know, and then the most important of all the things here is the two third to one third rule. And this is something that should be applied across virtually every type of essay you write in the exam. Two thirds of your time should be spent writing. One third minimum should be spent rewriting. You need to give yourself the time to go back and make those necessary corrections. Every mistake you find and fix is another mark. Think of it that way. They're not mistakes, they're marks as long as you give yourself the time to go back and, and correct them. Examiners are impressed by people who make changes. They don't see it as mess, they see it as improvement, they see it as evidence of critical thinking on your own part, of editing skills. So give yourself the time to do this. And the last thing just to mention, if you really are serious about being a writer, you should probably know that the average income for a published writer in Ireland is 6,200 euros a year, so you may need a second job. But let's spend a little time talking about potential short stories or short story forms that would work. You know, you're probably familiar with this. This is a, a story written by Ernest Hemingway in answer to a challenge. He was asked to write a short story in as few words as he could. And he came up with this for sale, baby shoes, never worn. It's phenomenal. It's evocative. It's, uh, you know, there's pathos in this. There is so much mystery contained in it, but it's really, really small. You know, the reason it's so small is because so much time is spent in honing it. You know, it wasn't something he tossed out immediately. He spent a lot of time coming up with something like this. And the point I'm making is that a short story does not have to be a long story. 
to do well in the leaving cert. In fact, there's three stories I'm going to point you to. Now, Popular Mechanics by Raymond Carver, which is 500 words long. One of These Days by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Columbia Nobel Prize winning novelist, which is a thousand words long. And Vanka by the Russian short story writer and, and, and dramatist Anton Chekhov, which is 1500 words long. I've put copies of all of those stories up on the website for you to download, read them. They're all super stories, but they're all short enough to be something that you could actually write within the time in the exam and still have the time left over to do the rewriting that you require to get a good grade. Um, so what do we get to? Well, you know, they say if you go into any challenge like this, you need to have some some backup, you know, pack a life jacket when you go into the exam and do the composition as well. So what sort of things have you done? Well, first of all, hopefully, by this stage, you've decided what type of essay you're going to write, what sort of writer you are. Stick to it, practice it, become better at that. Research. You know, as I suggested for the personal essay, pick some personas or some subjects which you could reuse in the exam and make sure that you have really understood them. But you're not just researching the subject, you're researching the vocabulary that accompanies that. You're thinking about the way that the examiner will look at your piece of writing and their focus upon how you write rather than what you write. So make sure that you're bringing those things with them, with you. And obviously timing, practice the timing. Make sure that you can write enough you don't have to write a huge amount, but you're writing enough so that it can have the desired effect and impact upon the examiner and that you're managing timing so that you're not in a tears when you actually get into the exam. So what else? Well, a few other things I would suggest. The first is to have a checklist. You know, you can't obviously bring in a piece of paper with writing on it into the exam, but prepare a mental checklist for yourself before you sit down and while you go back to rewrite. Have you remembered the sort of um, language features you have thought that you could bring into this, which might impress the examiner? Like, you know, have you used similes? Have you used metaphors? Have you used something like rhetorical question? Did you vary your punctuation when you look back on it? Or can you change some commas to semicolons, things of that nature, which show that command of language? Have those things in your mind and make sure that they are fresh there and that you can bring them up in front of your mind when you need them. The second thing is obviously because we're talking about language, vocabulary matters. Now, as a shortcut to helping you here, what I've done is I've put together a list of the 125 words you need to make you sound well read. And um, this is uh, something I've culled from a huge number of different word lists I found across the Internet and elsewhere. And, and I can guarantee you if you get a command of these words, it's only 125. That's probably one word a day between now and the leaving cert. It will give the examiner the impression of, of somebody who is well educated, well read and has a good command of language. It's up on the website there again, just like the examples of the short stories for you to download and use as, as you see fit. And then lastly, again, this is all about time. It's about time in two senses. One is the time that you spend now preparing for this section of the exam. It's 25% of your total grade. You, you, it deserves your time. It deserves some attention. Make sure that you build that into your study schedule, that it's not just about studying um, uh, Wordsworth or any of the other poets or Hamlet or any of the other texts, that you're spending enough time in this to reflect how much it's actually worth to you. And lastly, and probably most importantly, it's about time on the day. If you get the time wrong, you're in trouble. So practice this. Make sure you're always, as I said, giving yourself roughly a third of your time for rewriting. It also means when you write, you know, if you can't find the word instantly, if it doesn't come immediately to mind, just leave a space. It'll come back to you when you come to do the rewriting afterwards. Hone your writing. Make sure that what you end up with is something you're happy to put your pen down and say that reflects the best that I can do. That that displays how good a command of language that, that I have based on the study and the preparation I've done. So that's it for this section. What I would say is if you found this of value or there's things you'd like me to cover in future classes, please go to the website. There's a comment section at the bottom of the page and add a comment. Let me know what you'd like me to change. Let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to cover. I'm going to do another three of these classes. If there's something in particular you'd like me to do, then please pop it in there so let, and let me know. And lastly, um, I'm doing these free online classes uh, for a good reason, and that's to help raise money for a loan. Uh, a loan or a 
charity who provide invaluable support to older people in our society. And right now, at this time, with the coronavirus crisis, they are really in need of help. Now, they can't collect on street corners. They're losing a lot of other donations that people would normally give them. So um, if you go to the website, there are books for sale there. Any, uh, all the proceeds from those books go directly to a loan. If you don't want to do that, that's fine too. Please go to alone.ie and make a donation there. Um, that's it for this class. I hope it's been of value. And for those who are tuning in live again, it'll be Tuesday evening next week at, at 8 p.m. And I'll be posting um, more of these videos at the end of each class as well. Many thanks.